Thank you for joining us wherever you are. This podcast episode is brought to you by the Old Ways Actual Play Team. This Actual Play uses the 7th edition Call of Cthulhu tabletop role-playing game rules by Chaosium. This Actual Play is performed by adults and in an adult setting. While we try very hard to stick to language for all ages, listeners should know that this podcast may include mature themes. All content, including names, places, events, companies, and etc., that may bear resemblance to entities living or dead, is strictly coincidental. My name is Michael Diamond, and for tonight's game, I will be your keeper. Thank you for joining us again on another episode of the Old Ways Podcast. I'm your keeper, Keeper Michael, and we return to Mass of New Authentip in our Shanghai chapter. And so, as we'd like to do at the top of the show, we'd like to thank you, the listener, and especially you, the Patreon supporter. If you have not had an opportunity to join us on Patreon or on the, the Discord portion of Patreon, I highly suggest you do so. You can check all that out at patreon.com slash the Old Ways Podcast. Uh, we are going to get things started, but before we do, we're going to have introductions, which will begin to my right. This is Tiffany, and I play Maeve O'Shea, and uh, things are happening. Plans may be changing for you, Miss O'Shea. We'll find out more soon. To Miss O'Shea's right. This is Morgan. I play Lillian Lane, and I'd like to thank the backer that provided that hand of fate last game, so I did not kill Mr. Drummond or do something else unseemly to him that would result in injuring him more. Perhaps more later, though. At the end of the table. This is Jake. I'll be playing Jack Doyle, and we're going to have a dinner party. Oh, hmm. interesting. I can't wait to see how that shakes out. To Jack's right. Uh, this is Lonnie. I'm playing Robert Drummond. There is a party. I'm not invited. That's true. You are not. But don't worry. We'll find something for you to do tonight, Mr. Drummond. To uh, Mr. Drummond's right. Hi, this is Heather. I play Stasi. And Mr. Drummond and I, I believe, will be playing the roles of backup muscle uh, and watch you, watchful eyes on uh, as the group goes into the lion's den. Hmm. Or is it the dragon's den, I guess, in this case? Well, I don't think we should presume what animal miscal or not uh, Madam Lynn might take shape of. To Stasi's right. Hi, this is James, and I'll be playing Dr. Sigmund Tartenbach, who... Uh, is looking forward to dinner at some point, regardless of whether other people are around. Yeah, last time we saw the doctor, he was injected full of a bunch of pain medication and finally dozed off to sleep. Yeah. Again. Uh, but facial burns will do that. Last, most certainly not least. Uh, this is Alex playing Sam Baron, who is confident that Shanghai is happy to continue dropping trouble in our labs without us ever looking for it. It seems to be the way of things, yes? Uh, so we'll raise the curtain on, we'll say... The middle of the afternoon. So a few things have had a chance to transpire. Uh, Jack and Miss Lane have had an opportunity to go shopping, which they were very interested in doing. Uh, Stasi's had the opportunity to get cleaned up and take a nice long soak. Sam has probably had time to consider what the fuck people are doing. And someone has had a chance now, as we raise the curtain, to stop by the safe house and inquire after Miss O'Shea. I come in. I guess I just go to the room that they're working in. Mm -hmm. Is Jack Brady here? Uh, you, you don't see him around. Okay. But you do see that there are a couple of other gentlemen here now, down on the lower level. Hey, you get a um, you get sort of a military vibe from them. Oh, I see. Okay. This must be who he's been working with, running guns and all that. Possibly. Yeah. Gentlemen, and then I walk into the other room. They just nod. Maeve. Yeah. Uh, would you like to take a break this evening? What do you need? Well, we're going to be going to Madame Lynn's, and we just could use a little bit of um, your type of backup. That escalated quickly. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> I mean, if you need me, uh, yeah. Doctor, did you want to come along? Yeah, I will come along. I look over at Mr. Mu. Uh, are you going to be okay? Do you need anything while I'm out? My entire world will shatter if you're not here. 
Yes, I'm sure. Everybody's well. Mm. I should be fine. I'm plotting out a schedule for us to work. Okay. So enjoy your evening out. Maybe the last one for a little while. Okay. You want us to pick up some Chinese takeout? He looks at you a little funny. I believe it is just called takeout here, Jack. Oh, right. I will uh, continue my studies without you. Um, have a, a nice evening, both of you. And uh, Dr. We should speak later about um, a few things. Hmm. I look forward to it. I will gather up slander and head out. The group uh, can transition back to the hotel if they'd like. And then I guess what I'd like to know from the group now is um, what what sort of personal preparations are you making before Madeline? I want you to think about that while I talk with our friend, Robert Drummond. Mr. Drummond, you headed back earlier today to your house. Yep. You had an opportunity to check in to see if everything was sort of still in one piece and to get... A lay of the land. Yeah. And when you did, you walked into a rather shocking scene. And really, it's just one person. Oh. Who? That would be one Charles Pierce. Who is in your living room. Uh, hello. (laughs) Hello. Hello. Care to take a seat? Sure. I'll uh, pull up a chair. Tell me, Robert, how close are we to our goals here? Um, things have suddenly gotten sidetracked um, since we had some guests come in from uh, overseas. Guests? What kind of guests? Ah, uh, well, a group of friends of. Jackson Eliases are in town and leaving bodies everywhere they go. His eyes narrow. Hmm. So they made it out of England. Good. Okay. Um, so they told me they're on the trail of some cults. Yeah. Like Jackson was. Yeah. Just like her father was too. Her father. Yeah. Yeah. Miss O'Shea. Oh, I don't know if I remember her from... I don't think I remember her from Los Angeles. No. No. I mean, there were many people in the recovery beds in Los Angeles. It's possible she was one of them. You were more focused on someone else. Yeah. Well, now that I guess it's old home week, so I picked up uh, your flowers. Oh, good. Were they damaged? Nothing a little water and and, uh, soap wouldn't fix. But uh, she said something about being captured to drag you here. Yeah, she's talking about Lynn. As you can imagine, Lynn's very interested in anyone who is interested in the same thing that she's interested in. She sees the division as competition, a problem for her to potentially deal with. I disagree, of course. But I've received some very troubling information about Lin, and I don't know that Shanghai is prepared for the path she's going to choose. Well, she's moving guns, but I don't know why. (sighs) Robert, come on. You're smart. If she was running guns, why would she? Look past the economic benefit. Well, I assume they're going to people that she wants them to go to. My question my question is, we already have the Green Gang who basically runs all of that. And then you have Ho Fang. And I don't think Lin and Ho Fang are really um, friendly with each other. Not to my knowledge. Competitors, they respect each other, but that's about where it stops. But she's like lower on the totem pole than the other two. And I don't think she's going to go hit the streets in a gang war. That's, I I don't see that working for her. So. Not a gang war, but something else. 
What do you do with all those guns? <sighs> it's not that hard. The rest of them? Or is it... No. Lynn's forging her own path. She's a little tired of being under the heel of the current regime, the current makeup of things. She's going to fund her own political war. And when it doesn't work, and it won't, she's going to let those guns loose to people who will pull triggers for her. That's not going to work either. She should know that. She probably does. But if she starts a fight, and then everybody starts to fight. She could stand to gain in certain avenues. It might be a calculation she's made. Oh, Jesus. The political situation here, Robert, is unraveling. We know. Yeah. There are marches in the streets and uprisings from workers' groups. If you think about it and you connect those two, when you put a bunch of guns into the hands of workers who are already upset, what happens? Well, if I'm smart, I take the first I take the first boat out of town I can find. You bet. And a bunch of people will. But are the gangs going to fire on workers that work in their taverns and brothels and textile industries? Are they going to take it to their own workers and attempt to crack back and create order? More than likely. You bet. But the thing is, there's more people than there are gangs. And at some point... The city will break. I admit to not understanding it, but that's because if I was somebody with something to lose, I wouldn't want to throw it all in the pot and see what comes out. I think Lynn is betting on her play and betting hard. So are these Americans wrapped up with her now? They're trying to get some information on some other person who's here. They didn't give a name. But, uh, and also uh, information on Ho Fang. And they're mm-hmm. going to use some artifacts or something to uh, get a meet with her. Okay. To what end? They want information. They want they want to basically keep her off their back while they finish up what they're doing. Pretty direct, but it might work. Yeah, I mean... They're they're foreigners. They don't, uh, and their agenda doesn't really cross hers. Not yet. Well, they're not stopping her from doing what she wants to do. Yeah, not yet. Maybe not ever. Once they get a look behind the curtain about all the niceties, all the strangeness that Lynn has in that house, it's going to be real hard not to want what she has. Well, either way, um, our play here is pretty much similar. I don't want anything that Lynn has specifically, but I do have something for you to check out. What's that? It's a warehouse. It's close to the bun and pretty well protected. Its owner is a very prominent merchant in the city, which we're already familiar with. (laughs) Victor? No. Nope. Ho Fang. Oh. I found out he has something we need. So I want you to acquire it for me. What is it? It's a machine. Well, a a piece of a machine. That's awful not specific. Well, I'd give you more information than I had it. I got word from, um, we'll say, a very inebriated ship captain who arrived in the city just about a day ago. And before he got scooped up by Ho Fang's guys and strung up. He told me a story about um, parts that have been made at some plant in England. I went and checked it out myself while I was still there. Henson Manufacturing and the stuff they make, Robert, real strange. Huh. Never seen anything like it. The boys back at State are going to want to get their eyes on it, so I need you to grab me a couple pieces. But it's just machine parts, right? So like in a a crate? That's right. Think you can handle it? I think I can. Do you mind if I call in some backup on this? I don't. But you'll be mums about why we're doing it. You understand? I got you. Feed them whatever shit you have to. Not the truth, though. Speaking of that, I have a boat leaving town. Good luck. Don't end up dead. 
<laughs> he stands up. Thanks, boss. <laughs> Anytime. I left you a present under the mattress. Thanks. So we'll head back over to the hotel. How are the investigators preparing for a night at Madame Lynn's? First of all, Doc is getting Flesh Ward. Okay, you're going to cast Flesh Ward on the doctor. This requires, of course, an investiture. That's a four sand loss. Okay, so you're going to invest four sanity for a D6 worth of... So I'll do uh, three. Just 3d6. That's, a, that's quite the um, sand yeah. loss for just one, <laughs> one d6. No, I can do three. Just, I'm trying to help you out, doctor. You understand? Oh, well, yeah. yeah. Nine points of armor. Hey. But let's talk about how that happens. Yeah. So when she casts this on your body, you get very rigid. Hmm. One might say scaled. Okay. And it uh, is mostly in the main torso and back area. Hmm. You develop a, um, we'll say a uh, brown and, and, and yellowish scaling. Jack has a hard time coping with that, but. Uh... Mm -hmm. The flesh board lasts for 24 hours. Yes. Or until expended. So. Just in case, we'll just say for logistics purposes that the flesh board is cast around 2 p.m. And so on the next ellipse of that, that it will it will fade. Will fade. Pretty. And uh, you'll likely be wearing some high collared shirts. Uh, Doc was actually going to be getting some uh, quite a few high collared, a couple of high collared shirts anyway, and a scarf, um, mm -hmm. like a silk, you know, something something nice in the area because. A, a, a scarf or maybe a cravat or a... Something to cover up most of his neck and a good portion of his face. So, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting, too, and, and likely a little unsettling that when the scales run up this high, you do see them sort of alter and almost transform the burned flesh on your neck. And that's a little... On a 1 to 10, that's a 4 or so on the pain scale when that happens. He he uh he has to bear down for that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So that that's how you're preparing. It only takes you five rounds to do mm -hmm. that, which is nice. Miss Lane, how how are you preparing for this? Uh, Jack and I came back from shopping. I picked up um an outfit. They're very tight fitting, long to the to the ankle type dresses. Um, usually with a floral print. Mm -hmm. Um, I did get something for Maeve in um a a black and green. Type. I thought it would match her scaling very nice. It would probably cover most of it because I don't think I have any on my arms, do I? Not yet. <laughs> right. So they are they they have no sleeves on the on the on the dresses on them. And so I go and I give Maeve her outfit that I I purchased, and then I go and get myself ready. Mine is probably a black with floral print and blue and, and green because um, it's very popular. I have floral print on it, um, and I go and bathe and get myself ready and put my hair up, much like in the style that they would have worn. Um, I'm, I'm trying to match the fashion in Shanghai okay. in the 20s. Yeah. And that's how I get ready. You're a very fashionable person, and I so that, that helps out a ton. Does this dress allow me to have my knife on my thigh? I'm sure, I'm sure you could strap it to yeah. yourself if that's the plan. But well, yeah, it's usually on my thigh. Yeah. Yes, they are. They, there's room. Okay. I, I did that for myself as well. <laughs> so I'll make sure it wasn't too tight. I love the idea of the investigators here making sure that their dresses are flowy enough to, to make space for knives on thighs. There's a real Brahm energy here. Yeah, they're more form fitting on the top, going to your hips, and, and just a little lo looser on the, on the bottom. With those requisites made, then, gentlemen, we would turn to you. Jack, how are you dressing? I'm going to get a nice new suit that complements uh, Lillian's dress. Okay. So perhaps something blue like you wore in England or... Yeah. And then, of course, I have to ask Sam, huh, how are you? How are you? Are we going in the, the personal assistance? Are you doing anything to your overall makeup? So the only thing I'm swapping out, I had an informal black long coat that I was wearing uh, when I came off the ship. That's my reversible. I'm going to swap it out for your formal black long coat. 
otherwise, and probably a, a, a new white ring collar shirt, no tie. But I will, and, I, and I'll replace the scarf as well. But I'll go with my white gloves and the spats with shine shoes. But really, what I'm going to be spending my time doing is studying while I wait for everyone to get ready. Because we have from morning until evening, right? Yeah, basically. Okay. Yeah, I'll spend that time reading. What are you reading? I'm going to, once again, attempt to learn levitate. Oh. Well, you have the eight hours, so... That's my plan. Well, that's a hard intelligence roll. Damn it! Well, once again, a success, but not a hard success. Well, you, That is a 60 over 65. You study it some more. So then I suppose after all of you are... You take your days to, to prepare and, and to get ready. As we get closer to the afternoon, uh, Robert, are you coming back over to the hotel? Or are you staying put at the house or are you venturing out? I'm staying at the house. Alrighty. Then Stasi, uh, after your bath and um, clothing change and preparation, I suppose then are you coordinating with them as far as when they're going? Well, first I will change into something that will allow a limited amount of visibility for me in the shadows. Uh, And then, yes, uh, first, is Drummond back around yet? He has not arrived yet. Okay. You've not seen him actually since since you left the safe house. Well, then I guess it's up to me. All right. Outside backup. I'll grab Drummond when I can find him. Outside of that, a preference? <laughs> we, we should probably get Drummond. I don't know where he lives. Do you know where he lives? Actually, I do. We're going to come surprise you. <laughs> I don't know that I would want this group coming and surprising me. Mm-hmm. Just saying. Wait, wait. She's she's coming with? She is not going to come into the park. Mm. She's going to be back up outside along with Drummond. Okay, what if she gets found? Well, let's hope that doesn't happen. Like, if not- I get found, I won't rat you guys out. But the Sorry. thing is, is that it's, you guys need, it's probably better to have the backup than not have the backup. There's a lot more of them than there are of us. We've been in that situation before. What I'm saying is, like, if she gets caught outside, she's automatically going to assume that she's with us, and then it's going to destroy everything that we have. Not not I necessarily. I would be more comfortable with Stasi and Drummond there outside. Okay. If anything, she has not, to my understanding, connected the two of us, the, the two groups, well, me to you guys. So at least if we play that card, if I was caught, she, let's just say I will play up the angle of being a, what do they call it? Lone wolf. Well, and if she's already has caught on to who you, like, you know, right? then we're dead anyways. And Exactly. That's so it? either if she made me when I was delivering, then it's not going to matter. If she catches me outside and hasn't made the connection, then it's not going to matter. But if something goes down and you guys need an extra hand, it will matter. Besides, I can't stand the thought of sitting around here twiddling my thumbs. Please don't ask me to do that. Okay. I'll call up Drummond. Mr. Drummond, your phone rings. This is Robert. Drummond. This is Jack. Yeah, Jack. Are you coming this evening? Well, yeah, I was just waiting to hear from you guys. Okay, well, uh, we're ready to go. All right, I'll head over and then we can finalize uh, where you want us at. All right. And then you guys can take off ahead of us. Okay. So the main group is going to then, at some point, then take off from the hotel and head to Madame Lynn's. Mm Mm-hmm. Arrival at Madame Lynn's is, at night, is rather, well, it's rather beautiful. So the long walkway that some of you saw when you arrived here first is lit uh, beautifully by red lanterns that walk up the pathway. And then within the landscaping here, the green space around the house, there are these standing stone pillars. And the inside of them have lights. And they sort of shed light out and draw the first fireflies of the spring towards them. It's very peaceful here. It's very quiet. The street 
is quiet around her house. Um, the main walkway that wraps around this estate is um, accented with um, young to adult women who take various statuesque poses as they watch the space and uh, arriving at the gate and then walking up uh, Miss Lane you would likely be somewhere near the front I would imagine yes Uh Jack next to me certainly Uh, once you arrive at, at the doors you are greeted by something a little strange a older man thin wearing um a very simple black uh, long-sleeved shirt, a sort of white inner collar, black pants, a simple outfit. And he bows to you and Jack. He stands back and then reaches up towards the door, which begins to open as he gestures towards it. I nod my head to him. His eyes very much don't get even close to meeting yours. They stop about knee at most. And that's really just to to make sure that you are moving towards the open space. I link my arm into, I'm assuming I already did, but I linked my arm into Jack's arm and I look at him and I'm like, are we ready to do this? Absolutely. Did you bring a gun? Of course I brought a gun. They'll probably take it from me, but but I brought it. Is is it sort of two by two then? Yeah. Yes. It's definitely dock and lock. Right. Absolutely. And then I would imagine, the same. are you flanking Miss Miss Lane's other side? Uh, I'd be behind, behind it to the right, so. You move into an interior space, which has had an awful lot of care put into it. A lot of thought has been put into this space. It's not by any means at least this portion of it, grandiose in the items that you're seeing up front. But all of the woods here are finely carved and polished. The floor here is impeccably clean. The lighting here is just so. And at the end of this rectangular space, uh, you see Madeline, those of you who have seen her, walking towards the group. Uh, She is wearing a red dress with a beautiful stylized dragon that wraps around piece. She's not a very tall woman. She's very, she's very average in both height and weight. Um, She's a bit athletic as far as her overall build goes. Um, Her hair is up. And if you didn't know any better, You'd probably think five minutes ago she was working um, because she seems to have a an energy that she brings with her. How old is she? How old does she look? <clears throat> she looks probably in her late 30s. Hard to tell. Sometimes it's hard to gauge a woman's age just by their looks. It's very true. And when you have gray hair or a streak of it, people will think you're old. Madeline approaches the group and keeps a respectful but reasonable distance, probably five to eight feet, and she nods. She she does not bow to you, and she gives you a smile. I bow to her mm-hmm. as a sign of respect because we are in her house, and I I smile. And, um, Madam Lynn, thank, thank you so much for the invitation this evening. Of course. Uh, let me introduce my companion. This is Mr. Jack Doyle. I bow. She nods. And also with me, um, this is Sam. And also I have brought with me, um, this is Miss Ms. M- Mave O'Shea. Um, she is a well-known lounge singer in America. Hmm. And her companion for the evening is Dr. Tottenbach. A deeper bow. I just nod. She smiles at the both of you and and she nods at you, doctor. Mm -hmm. She gestures towards a side room, just right where, just basically right off where she's standing. Please come in. I head towards the the parlor. In this space, there are a series of chairs 
around a big, wide, square table. The chairs are very simple, um, but the lighting in here is pretty fantastic, actually. <laughs> there are different hues, reds, golds, from the lighting, the lantern lighting in here. And you smell fresh tea, sort of wraps your senses. May I interest you in something to drink? Refreshments before we begin? How large is the room, can I ask? The room is r- roughly, and don't get any ideas, it's about 20 by 20. Okay. The reason I was asking is because like, if they're, if they're depending on how far they're going, mm-hmm. if I'm going to assume kind of the role of, you know, w- w- walking, walking, you know, security, mm-hmm. then I would probably take up like a position at the door mm-hmm. and just stand there. I would collapse my hat, tuck it away, and just kind of stand there. Stiff as a board. Seems fair. Whatever that wonderful smell is, I would love to have a drink of that. Hmm. Would you? She brightens. How familiar are you with uh, tea from Shanghai? I have not had the privilege of partaking in your your fine tea. Hmm. This tea, oolong, is... It's not found just anywhere. She, um... She raises her hand as if to no one. And the door opens and staff step through. They sort of carefully circumvent, if necessary, your um, bubble space, Sam. So they don't get... If they, Next step aside. You don't really need to. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like They just sort of flow around you, these two young staff members. So tell me... I received this recommendation from someone I respect, which is not, it's not what I had expected. I wouldn't think that you would be um, so acquainted with Mr. Moo. We actually just became recently acquainted um, just due to our interest in artifacts. And the Lane family has had a long history in dealing in various luxuries, art, horses, Yes. Um, actually, I have my very own collection of artifacts in America that you may be interested in. Indeed, I might. So Mr. Moo was kind enough to write a recommendation after our, our long conversation over dinner the other night. Oh, that is most fortunate. There are not many unrecommended guests that I take in. We appreciate the invite. Hmm. I'm very glad you do, Miss Lane. They begin, the staff members begin pouring tea. It's very much, it takes up your entire senses because the room is devoid of most other scents. And you can tell that it's a very strong version of this tea. She takes a glass and smiles and then drinks. I mean, if she's drinking, I feel like it's safe enough to drink. I guess yeah. what I want to know is, is anyone not drinking tea? Doorman is not drinking tea. Well, you're just standing, Sam, so. I think it'd be rude not, not to, so. Yeah, I mean, she's not going to offer Sam tea, nor would the staff, because he's standing there. It would be rude not to. Yes. Indeed it would. We would be offered in her house hospitality and refreshments, and to turn them down would be considered the act of rudeness. Right. As a career poisoner, that's why I'm standing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you get this sort of sweet and fruity, like there's a little honey aroma here in the air. Um, it's pretty complex, and the tea tastes really good. Doctor, this is excellent. Madam, I, this is fantastic, and I must appreciate it mm. to its fullest. Don't shit. I will make sure you have some to um, take back. You are most gracious, madam. I have had tea all over the world, and I must say that this is hands down the best I've had. Quite the compliment. She produces a cigarette and a large sort of silver holder, and Doc offers to light the cigarette. Oh, no, 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 no. I, I thank you very much. I prefer to do it myself. 
Unless you have a match. I don't know. Do I? Oh, I probably do. Yeah. She leans over and allows you to light her cigarette. I will. We can roll psychology. I want to. I I want to psych. I want to psych. Sure. Bell on that. What do you? T- t- I mean, I, I, psychology? I want to. I want to give her a once over in her actions towards Maeve and Lillian versus her discussion towards me and Jack. Not just in preference, but I also want to see if she is subtly manipulating or attempting to manipulate Maeve and Lillian. Sure. Not in a negative way, but just so that to her end. Mm. 16. Your psychology is what? Uh, my P psychology is 79. So 16 is one over an extreme. Okay. So it's a hard. Yep. Unless you're going to spend the point of luck. Uh, you know what? I will. I oh, will finally man. spend it a point of luck because I want to, not because I have to. Right. Well, I'll just say it. Because I think that directness sometimes is best. Um, she doesn't give a shit about you or Jack or anybody else. Didn't think so. No, we are literally just dressing. <laughs> you're you're able to discern this not just through her, her, the way her eyes seem to to, to stay on them and to engage with them, mm. and sort of just to barely give you any sort of taste or brush of her actual presence. Mm. But um, there are subtle physiological things that are happening. Mm with her that uh, give away her state. Yeah, he just kind of fades backwards out of the conversation. So, Miss Lane, tell me, uh, artifacts, yes? And you had one you were going to bring? Yes, Mr. Doyle. Right, I will get the case out and open it up, turn it to her. Please have him take it out. Can you please remove it? Yes. This is the crown of Nictocles. <laughs> Legend says that she w- she uh, was a pharaoh that saved Egypt from the black pharaoh that controlled it before her. Not unsurprising that I have not heard from her, uh, especially given how easily women in history are wiped clean by their um, male counterparts. Indeed. We found it uh, while we were in Egypt recently. Really? Expedition? Of sorts. Yeah. Hmm. We uh, we did see a few pyramids out there. Hmm. Sounds exciting. I'd like to travel to Egypt one day. I find it fascinating. But the work I am doing here is very important. They uh, they don't appreciate my style of music. I will tell you that. Yes, uh, uh, a jazz singer. Hmm? Yes. Fantastic. We have such a scene of culture here in Shanghai when it comes to jazz. So many wonderful voices that join the symphony here. Perhaps um, perhaps you would be good enough to sing for us. Sure. Wonderful. She does something very strange that you pick up on, Doctor. Mm. She sits back like you would Mm -hmm. or like other men you have seen would like in a cigar bar. Mm-hmm. Like she's going to take this in. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This is she. She's sitting back in the the power position to enjoy the room uh-huh. position. I um, Doc also noted that the streets outside are the only quiet streets that we have seen in Shanghai. Oh yeah, which means that Madame Lin not only has money but enough power to make her streets quiet around her building. Speaking of outside this elegant estate. Two relatively different folks are scoping out some things. So for you, Stasi, and you, Mr. Drummond, I would like two separate roles. One of them is stealth, and the other is spot hidden. I succeeded on the stealth with a 43 under 70, but Mm -hmm. I failed the spot hidden 83 over 55. All right, and then Stasi. So for spot hidden, uh, I... 62 under 65. Uh, for stealth, I actually rolled an 86 for 85. I'd like to spend some luck, too. How much luck would you like to spend? So I would just like to spend a couple of points of... Yep. <laughs> get under that mark. Just get under the margin. Now, it's so. critical and important that we, we remind folks who are spending luck to make skill checks. Remember, just as a uh, an aside, 
if you are spending luck to make skill check, you are not ticking those boxes as successful rolls because luck does not allow you to do that. Okay, so both of you manage to stay hidden as you watch this dance go on. And the dance to you, Stasi, is fascinating because you see an almost interlocking, interwoven guard pattern here on this building that is more than 10 people involved in it on multiple floors. It would be very difficult for someone to penetrate this building from the outside without being seen, unless they were, well, quite frankly, invisible, right? Uh, What you pick up on as far as the spot hidden is, um, you pick up on movement near the back of the house in part of the yard. You can't yet determine who it is or what, but something is moving back there. And it doesn't appear as if Mr. Drummond has noticed. Is it just, say, uh, rustling around, or is it actually moving across the yard towards the house? Is that, I mean, is, is it going in a direction versus just kind of moving in a small, uh, centralized, you know, loca- uh, localized uh, spot? Yeah, it's the latter. It's moving in a very localized spot. And the only thing that you're really seeing is okay. that there are changes in the shadows there just a little bit. So there's probably something possibly caught or captured in that area. So as we're watching everything, I take a couple of minutes and really try to make out whatever I can in that area. And then very gently uh, tap Mr. Drummond on the side to get his attention and without saying anything just gesture with my hands you know look there in you know try to look there in that spot (laughs) just gesturing with hands I'll look over where she's pointing or gesturing or and I'll try to indicate like you know look right there yeah, I mean, if, if you wanted to push the roll, you can. I've gotten some help, so absolutely, I'd love to push that Certainly. roll. And I failed it even worse this time. 87 over 55. I don't see a thing. Or I see uh, not something. Only do you, not only do you not see it, you, um, you accidentally stare directly into one of these stone pillars with the light on it too long. Mm-hmm. And you get that, um, that candle or that light flicker blinding in your eye and so you're you're going to be uh, rubbing your eyes for a few minutes to try to get that out yeah well it's a fantastic crown you hear her say I don't think it's something I would wear but to what do you know about it other than where it came from and who wore it not much other than she uh, seemed to possess a lot of power herself And you came to this determination how? Reading some of the uh, hieroglyphs. Oh, yes. A language all unto themselves. Not what I'm completely familiar with, but... Very well. I I look forward. What what song will you sing? I'll uh, pick a song I was familiar with singing in Chicago. And, and how familiar are you with um, Cantonese? Only a little bit. Mm. Well, I look forward, uh, hopefully, to a day when uh, you can try some songs in the in the more traditional language here. Oh, definitely. I'm working on it. I I have been learning the language. I just don't think I am quite versed enough to do any kind of justice when singing. Mm. Please let us hear. Uh, Keeper. Yes. While the room is enraptured with the music, I would like to take an opportunity to, I'll say covertly, take a couple steps into the room and get a really good look around at what's in here, in her parlor. If there's anything of a note of interest, you know. Sure. Go ahead and give me a uh, spot hidden roll and then depend upon your success level. 
I'll let you know what you see. I think I can spend one luck to make that a hard success. So I will do that. That's a 4,385, <laughs> right? This room is not nearly as interesting as it probably should be. And I say that because what you notice is that there are likely several cabinets or pedestals that have been moved out of this room relatively recently. The flooring here is spectacular and very well maintained, but something of weight was sitting over to the left and to the right of this table and it's no longer here. It could be for any number of reasons, but that you pick up on. The other thing that you pick up on is Lynn herself, and she physically holds herself Except when Maeve begins to sing and she sits back, she physically holds herself as someone who is constantly prepared for something to go wrong. Of course. It's not that she's on edge. It's that she stays prepared. And I want to be clear, like as far as my movements are concerned, I'm not going far. It's more like I shuffle a bit yeah. if, if I'm noticed at all. Yeah, no, that's that's what I figured. I got a 41 out of 68, but I'd like to spend the uh, luck to make it a hard success, Mm. which I would bring it down to a 34. Certainly. I will not stop you from spending luck to do so. And then what I would like you to do is make me a power roll. Posed, of course. Yeah. What you got there? A 41 again. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know what's wrong with these things. What's your current power now? 83. So 41 is hard. Yep. Okay. Uh, so when you sing, when you begin this song and continue it on, you keep Madame Lynn's attention during the song. Um, you find her, during the song, you find her eye contact a bit, not, not overpowering, just not something that you're used to. Like when she ta- when she watches you sing, she keeps consistent eye contact with you. And after a while, it's a little... I don't know. You can take it however you would like, um, but you're not used to it from that much from another woman. Men, absolutely. Right. But this is a little strange. Mm -hmm. Um, When you finish, she gives you a polite applause and then stands up. Well, I have seen what you have to offer, Miss Lane. Would you care to see... My collection. Absolutely. I would be honored if you would show me your collection. Wonderful. Right this way. Are my companions allowed to come as well? Miss O'Shea, certainly. Uh, The rest of them, of course, I would just, as with any guest, I would ask that you not touch anything. Feel we will be okay here. Of course. Go, run along. Enjoy yourselves. Okay. Mr. Doyle, I yeah. take it you will behave yourself while I'm away? Yes, of course. Thank you. So the two of you move off with Lynn. Sam, are you are you staying? Um, when they move to the door and go to leave, mm-hmm. I'm going to act as if I didn't hear what the hell she said. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to move in behind Lillian as if as if her life depends on me. It doesn't seem like Madame Lynn objects in any way. She moves on to the next room. Her next stop is almost a small museum section. So you walk not into another small room or something like that. You walk into a space which is much larger than you were expecting. And it looks, it reminds you of a museum in here because wide open spaces there are objects in, in all sorts of spaces and shapes. There's mo- room to move around and to, like, you know, put your hand and, and consider things and judge a piece. And it's it's very, um, it's just not something you're used to inside somebody's home. And it also speaks to the grandeur and the money that she has. Most people don't in their house don't have space for this sort of grandeur. This would be something akin to what you would see at your father's house in Philadelphia. This is a viewing room where like, look at this beautiful shield that we have on the wall that we can just spend, you know, 20 by 20 foot of space just to sit and look at this thing. Uh, So some of the things that you see in here, there are a series of statues, um, which is probably, it's probably good that Doyle's not here. Right. I just thought that. (laughs) 
sticky fingers. You see at one end a strange copper statue made up of a bizarre snake tortoise hybrid. It's tarnished to age with a black, a dull a sort of blackening. It's um, it's rather fearsome and impressive. You see a, a religious painting, it looks like. There's a fabric scroll that's been made with a, and backed with a, a blood red silk. Uh, there's tassels and cords adorn it. Miss Lane, you see a book that you know. You see a very well-worn copy of the I Ching. I, like, I look around the room and I, as an art collector or coming from a family of art collectors and um, your collection is beautiful. Thank you, Miss Lane. I appreciate that. It's been cultivated over many years. I can see you have taken great care to pick important pieces. I think many of them are important to Shanghai and its future because the only way to secure someone's future is to secure their past. So do you have a particular favorite piece? Oh, yes. These, uh, well, I have many favorites, but the, the bells here are amazing and truly interesting. She takes you over to a wide table and you see bells. And it appears anyway that they're perhaps each one of them patterned and crafted after a dragon. Like it doesn't make up one whole dragon. It's just each one is a dragon. Yeah, the is set. Is it different? Okay. The set, which totals actually nine. Um, she has you. Feel free to look as close as you'd like, of course. Um, Maeve, you see in the corner over there, she has a golden ump. Right side up? Yep. I will walk over to it. The ankh is probably an inch and a half thick. It's likely fairly heavy. This whole room feels like it ebbs, though. There are things in here that speak. And you're not certain whether or not Madame Lin knows that. But you can feel it. Is the ankh one of them? You'd have to examine it to be sure. Well, I was going to walk up and see if it has any writing or anything. Or if I get closer, can I feel like... I would imagine that like when I... When something has like a strong pull, it's almost like your heart beats harder. Like you can feel... That's the problem for you in this room is that like there's so much draw from table to table to different piece that like... I don't want to say it's like having a panic attack in here, but that's what it feels like. Each like it's one oppressive. Has, wow, there's this in here and then there's this in here and then there's, look at these bells and then look at this. Wow. Like that's the, mm-hmm. the focus that you get from this room. Uh, my gentlemen who are in the tea room, please make me a listener roll. Hard difficulty. And then that will also go for the folks outside hard difficulty. Listen. 97 over not 97. 97 over what, to be 97 clear? 97 over 68. Okay. So not a fumble, just a fail. Okay. Just checking. Yep. I like to check my fumbles. My ears begin to bleed because I fumbled a listen roll. <laughs> there goes your armor. What the hell? Oh, God. They, they actually just yeah. fell off. Yep. <laughs> uh, Jack? 80 over 47. Okay. So not a great listen roll, but not a fumble. And then outside? That is, I don't hear a damn thing. That is a 99 over 50. I will spend 10 luck to make that a success. Okay. So just so you're aware, before you spend your luck, Lonnie, it's hard difficulty required. Oh, hard difficulty. Okay. Then no, I will not spend. Okay. Very good. Um, so so you have enough listen for that roll to not be a fumble, which is good. <laughs> um, and because I suppose given his position in the room, I, I will give Sam a listen roll on this. Um, because he's going to be, you know, radar up the entire time. That would be a hard success, 17 over 63. Uh, Sam, you hear the very distinct sound somewhere a little farther away from where you're at of what sounds like someone cutting glass. So I guess when I hear it, where... It, well, so I know May went to check out an Ankh. Mm-hmm. Is Lillian and the Madam, like, are they kind of like paired off right now? 
Mm, I think the three of them are probably milling about the space. I mean, they're looking at the nine bells or um, looking at some of the other pieces that are that are here. I'm just looking for the thing with the strongest pull. If I can discern that by walking by them, you're not a you're not a detect magic. Uh, Why not? Ro- because <laughs> I want to be a divining rod. Well, yeah. Mm. You gotta learn that spell, and then what you do is you grab me like that one guy did, and use it to find the stick in the yard. Yes. Yeah. Um, no. So I will. I'm going to very quickly like cover the distance in a couple steps. Uh, move in next to Lillian, opposite the side that the madam is on, Certainly. in general. Lillian, we have a problem. What is it, Sam? Someone is trying to break in. The question is, do we alert the owner of this house? We should probably inform her that somebody is trying to break into her home. Because it's not us. Then I will stand up straight. I will, I, I'm will. not going to address Madam Lynn. I will stand basically next to Lillian to confer information if asked. But I will definitely, like, my feet will definitely clack against the floor. Madeline notices, obviously. The subtleties like that are not lost on her. If you'd like, Miss O'Shea, uh, you may make a Cthulhu Mythos roll on the bells, since you are examining them. That's a 34 out of 39. That is a successful Cthulhu Mythos roll. Uh, so, you have heard of these before in a... Um, well, we'll say in the Noctic scripts. You believe that the dragons on them are not dragons at all. You believe they're hunting horns. And they're locked in combat with Biaki. You are concerned because A, the bells are uncovered and could be rung. And if they're rung in the right sequence... They can summon hunting horns. Maybe they could also summon a Biaki. You enjoyed that thought. Uh, Madam Lynn looks at in your direction, Sam, and she says, breaking in. Permission to speak freely. This is not a naval ship. Please, what information you have could be useful. I believe that someone is attempting to intrude into your house, and with your permission, I would like an opportunity to intercept them. Well, far be it for me to keep man from being useful. Go right ahead. I, I kind of short bow, um, and I will give a very knowing glance to Lillian as I move out of the room. Sam. Slam. Why don't you go pick up Jack while you're um, looking for intruders? I was on my way. Yeah, I will hustle out, and um, as I pass the room, I will whistle. Okay. So that is sort of un... There's no way to miss that. Uh, Doctor and Jack, um, there's a sharp whistle. And you can hear the footsteps coming down the floor. I just nod to Jack because I know what he's already going to do. <laughs> yeah, he's pulling out a gun. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Outside, Stasi, that shadow moves. And when it moves, it moves and then leaps towards first floor, second floor overhang, and then it, you see a form climb up onto this second floor balcony. And before before it really even gets set into place, you can see it land against one of the windows. Not hard, but land in time. And you start hearing now this weird sound. And it's almost like someone's trying to resonate with, with a piece of glass. And then, a moment later, your brain connects the two sound and the, the truth. And you hear the, someone finishing cutting glass. I smack Drummond hard in the chest Oof. and Ow. point up. What was that for? Look. And yeah. I point, like, point up at the area, like almost moving his head. Like <laughs> She points your vision upward towards the second floor, and you can see this sort of shadowy form reach in through like it, it sort of goes off balance and then you see one of the windows on the second floor open and this thing dive inside those of you inside hunting now uh, getting a lay of the land here is a little tricky um, so getting back to the front space Sam you doctor and Jack would find 
a staircase that goes up to the second floor. Um, you also hear other footsteps in the house. Like, you can hear someone moving upstairs. If, if I thought that the sound was above me, I wasn't going to stop moving past the, the, the lounge, so I was going to head up and try to... I'm going to try to get ahead of my um, adorable mouth-breathing companions so that I can intercept our, you know... Um, <laughs> intercept from a, from a more careful oh. position. I'm going to enter the space and hunt the hunter, if you will. Fantastic. So, Miss O'Shea, while you and um, Lillian are still downstairs, and now that Sam has moved off, um, Madame Lynn draws you over to this copper statue. Oh, I was going to ask her before we move along. I was mm-hmm. going to ask her. Um, so, um, these spells... Are they in a specific order? Well, I tried to arrange them so that they would be visually appealing. Uh, it seems that's worked. I don't think I have anything to tell if she's lying or not. Psychology is best you can do. Everybody has a little psychology. Yeah, I have 15. You can roll psychology. That's an 83. Mm, yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. She seems to be being totally reasonable and truthful. But... Uh, Oh, I probably don't know the order they're in, or what order it needs to be in. So. Well, she takes the both of you over to this darkened statue, and she sort of lovingly puts one hand on it, and you can see her move like along the ridges of the statue of this dark warrior. And if you'd like, the two of you can roll a cult. Ooh, well, I Ooh. can't psychometry that. That bad boy? You can absolutely psychometry if that's what Don't you want to do. touch shit. She touched shit. It's not doing anything. Touch yeah, but she doesn't have your power. Go ahead. Blow your brain up. Listen, your cult's higher than mine. Yeah, it is. <laughs> that is a 60 out of 92. Mm. Do I need to spend to get it to a hard? No, I don't think so. Okay. Uh, so you would identify this as a creature of Chinese mythology, which is associated with winter, water, and the north. Um, it is a fairly rare piece to have, especially one so large. What about Cthulhu Mythos? Not applicable for this piece in her collection. Oh, okay. All right, I'm going to touch it. All right, go ahead, touch it. And of course, using psychometry. I am using psychometry. I have a 26 out of 50. Okay. Any interest in spending a point of luck to make that a hard success? Sure. I'll spend a point of luck. Mm, very good. The question is, is how long does it take for her to get what she wants? So you're going to have to have in physical contact with this piece for five rounds. And so when you inspect it with Lynn there, and when, when Miss Lane inspects it, after her cursory fingertips, like sort of, trace out the the piece of this snake and tortoise creature, you realize that her hand stopped moving. I want to distract her. (laughs) You realize that Madame Lynn has noticed that suddenly Miss Lane is very still. Mm -hmm. And you see her sort of just very slightly tilt her head as if to consider what's going on. So is this your favorite Piece. Mm. Oh, no, 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 no. Not at all. No, no. I keep most of the favorite pieces in the reliquary downstairs. Oh, I just thought, you know, uh, maybe you liked winter, you know, since it is uh, for the symbol for winter in the north. How's that fast talk work for you, Mr. Uh, Shea? Not very good. Let's have it. What I'll do, I'll get that fast talk from, but I would like... Sam to give me a track roll because okay. he's he's going to be tracking in the upstairs. Oh, thank God. 12 out of 50. Ooh, 12 out of 50. That's pretty good fast talk for you. Mm. That's a hard success. So we'll uh, see if she can. Uh, she will meet your hard success. So it's a, it's a basically a wash. So you talk really rapidly and hopefully keep her attention. And you're hoping that keep her from wondering what the, what the hell Miss Lane is doing. Um, Unfortunately for you, or maybe fortunately, depending upon your perspective, um, you keep her attention. 
the whole time. And you get this feeling like, okay, yep, I have her attention. Hmm. Sam, your track roll. That is a, it's a 24 under 76. It's a hard success. Okay. So, uh, Doctor, you and Jack are heading up after Sam. He's he's already reached the top of the stairs basically by the time you get to him. He is he's moving with purpose. Sam, you track the noise and the subsequent footfalls that are headed back towards the, the back end of the house. And it seems like they're doing it at a relatively quick pace. Like they may know already that the jig is up. If I'm following them. And they, they are likely going to hear the, the other footfalls as well once the crowd starts. So I will attempt to overtake them. Without knowing the lay of the land, I will make, I will make any assumptions I have to, to to try to either head them off or to predict where they're going. I will keep that in mind. Outside, Drummond and Stasi, what are the two of you doing after you see someone basically break into Madame Lynn's house? First, I want to, want to take a moment just to see how the uh, the per- proverbial net of guards do any of them notice this happening does anybody go do we see any activity from the outside that is the maddening thing you don't see a single guard outside react to this and that was just after seeing how concerted and and near s- synchronous they are at coverage and it's just nothing happened do we hear the whistle? I think the house is too big for that. Give them where they are and give them where you are. Okay. So we don't know that they've stirred the action. No. Nope. Okay. And you can hold position here and see what happens. Totally up to you, but I figured I'd give you the option. Yeah. Um, we. Well, I don't know about her, but I'm holding position. I am not moving because first thing they would do is try to kill me. I mean, you might be right. And that's if we can get past the guards. That's correct. Yeah, I think we will pause for a couple of beats at least to see what happens. Um, okay. I'll watch the guard movements. I will watch and ear <laughs> keep keep ears and eyes peeled on on the house for anything initially, just until either something changes or we decide to. We just can't stand sitting here anymore. Okay, fair enough. Miss Lane, you get a powerful image in your mind. You see a tall, elegant Chinese woman with long, flowing black hair, completely straight down the side of her, her shoulder and then off her back. You see her standing on a rock with the ocean crashing around her. And you see out of the ocean comes this form, this bipedal tortoise. And it, it, it makes this almost inhuman sound, opens its maw. And you can see this tortoise has just this sharp, powerful jaw and beak. And down the sides of it, just on the sides of that shell, there are intricate characters which have been painted onto this. And you can see this woman calling the creature closer, speaking high on the air. You can hear her words reverberate around the air. I'm assuming I can't understand anything she's saying. No clue what she's saying. So what is the, the large tortoise doing? It basically seems like it's calling to her. Like it, it's it's answering whatever call you get. The emotion that you get is almost, I don't want to say familial. I want to say the energy is acceptance. Well, I mean, does the woman seem evil in nature or? I, I, how do you judge if someone's evil? The feeling you get from her is that she's called this creature to her. And she is telling it that she accepts it. And really, it's the last bit of that vision that is truly awe-inspiring. And that is the slight caps on the waves out in the ocean there. 
one, two, three, four, all these little white caps, which suddenly are, are not white caps at all. They're the tips of beaks coming out of the ocean. Beaks of? Like similar beaks that this tortoise in front of you has. Oh, so it has a family. Indeed. And you come out of it. And you feel, you hear yourself gasp. Sam, you hit the end of the hallway and veer sharp left. Only because that's exactly what your quarry does. Okay. Have I, do I have eyes on them yet or am I still just listening for them? No, you have eyes on them. They're in this room. They're at the far end of it. And they know that they've been cornered. And so their lights are off in here, obviously. There's just no light. And you can hear them steady breathing. Is there a light switch? There are no electric lights here on the second floor. So I go into a room, is what yeah. you're saying, right? Okay. Then what I would like to do is I'm going to shut the door behind me <laughs> ominously. Okay. And as I do so, I would like to spend a point of sanity. Okay. Um, and I would like to use my augmented pulp talent mm -hmm. to mimic somewhat of import to this person. All right. And I'm going to approach slowly with my hands out because it's, it's a dark room, right? Yep. Um, and I will say, I know you're scared. Let me help you get out of here. And I will try to basically... Are there windows in this room? Yeah, there will be windows in this room. So I will venture into the moonlight with my eyes closed mm -hmm. and let them react to whatever it is they see. You hear a voice you recognize. Dad? Whose voice is it? It's Mr. Jones. Oh, man. And that is where I'm going to call the episode of Closed Night. So <laughs> thank you so much for joining us in this episode of Masks from the Tip. We hope you are enjoying the Shanghai chapter as much as um, we are. So thank you and good night.